Namaskar, everybody, and welcome to another Wednesday meditation session. I hope you're doing well and uh, enjoying your lives wherever you are living. Let's get going. Today we are We'll be touching upon two of the koshas. We've been doing the Manumaya kosha, the subtle mind, the place of subtle thought, or thought in general. And today we're going to be touching also upon the Atimanas kosha. Let's see, let's put that there, Atimanas kosha. We are still looking at memory, but we're looking at a different type of memory. First of all, what did we do last week? So last week we were looking at what we call uh, cerebral memory. So it's a memory that's dependent upon the nervous system, upon the brain. And we were talking about this memory as being a sort of a scaffolding for life, um, as a resource for life. So a memory that one may use in order to build a sense of identity, memories that one uh, uses uh, to gain experience in life so that one can be better able at making decisions, the right decisions at the right time. And the uh, memory that helps build skills, right? So <clears throat> it could be the skill of a musician or the skill of an orator. So those types of memories, and, and we looked at how one can um, work on those memories to make them as positive as possible, as supportive as possible in one's life. So one can time travel into the past and we can reframe those memories of the past. Um, one can uh, reduce their toxicity, if you will, and make them more supportive of how one is thinking and living in the present. And then one can actively create positive memories that will support one's future self. One can take action that will be constructive so that when one looks back on those actions, when one gets into the future, one is content with the way one lived one's life. So this is what we explored last week, memory as a resource to support the act of living in a positive, constructive way. Today, I'd like to explore extra cerebral memory. So this is memory that's not dependent upon the brain, upon the nervous system. It's in the mind, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the brain. This type of memory is often thought about in terms of reincarnation. Now, it's not everybody that believes in reincarnation. It's uh, especially a belief that one finds in the Eastern world, uh, in the Buddhist world, in the, in the Hindu world, for example, and also in the spiritual world of yoga. There's a, a firm belief that um, we progress through many incarnations. So the idea then is when one is incarnated into a new life, one is less subjected to the conditioning of that particular society, that particular family, that particular religion one may be born into. The, uh, the baby or the infant uh, is still unconditioned. It's still very open. It's still very free in that sense. So its mind is not weighed down by all of the aspects of this new life that it's yet to encounter. So the mind then can access the previous life. There are lots of 
anecdotes about this. I mean, lots of examples, especially in the East, of children who will give names of people that maybe they knew in a past life or their relatives from a past life. So their mind is still able to access the past because it's not been influenced as much by the present. Even if one looks at, say, child prodigies, let's take Mozart, for example. I mean, Mozart was playing the piano at the age of three, or some say four, and the story goes that, you know, he observed his sisters playing the piano and he picked it up in that way. But he's making symphonies, you know, at a very young age. And so prodigies like that suggest that perhaps Mozart had inherited the memory of piano playing from a previous life. It was something that was in his subconscious mind, if you will, in the mind that came from the past into this new body and was able to express itself very early on in those uh, formative years. And maybe we've had experiences where we've had an epiphany that something happened in life that was completely out of context, not related to what we already knew, like in our cerebral memory. I mean, in my case, um, I was raised a Catholic and I was dragged to church every week by my mother. And I, I resented that, but uh, there were moments when I would have these epiphanies sitting in the church. Maybe it was the incense, it was the atmosphere, it was the singing, but I would, my mind would connect with something very cosmic, very mystical which wasn't related to anything about my day-to-day -day life. So that suggests perhaps there was a resonance between what was happening in that church and a previous incarnation that I had. So this is extra cerebral memory, and it's related to the Atimanis Kosha, and I put the... Um, the spelling of Atimanas there. So Atimanas now is taking us to a very subtle part of the mind. It's called causal mind. The cause is that which created the universe. So it's the or origin of all life. It's the consciousness, the intelligent consciousness that was able to create this magical universe in which we live. So when we say the causal mind, we're talking about a part of the mind that's less subjected to the temporal influence of day-to-day -day life. It's less subjected to the conditioning of the lower, I don't like to use the word lower, but the yeah, let's say to the lower uh, layers of the mind. It's because of that conditioning, as mentioned earlier, that we don't access the more subtle parts of the mind. Maybe we have these epiphanies or we have these creative inspirations where we are taken out of our conditioning and we access the uh, infinite wisdom of the universe. So extra cerebral memory then enables us to do that. It said that a meditator, when he or she transcends the limited conditioning of the constructed society around us, he or she can access not just the past lives, but can access all of the history um, of the universe. We often talk about that in meditation as connecting to infinite consciousness. So the notion there is that we are all a part of this consciousness. And when we meditate, we connect to the latent memory, the extracerebral memory, the subtle memory of that consciousness. So the spiritual person seeks to meditate to access that subtlety and then to bring it into day-to-day -day life. So there's another term I'm going to put up here. 
which is Dhruva Smriti. Smriti is memory, and Dhruva has the sense of being fixed, like one-pointed. Here it's often translated as permanent, permanent memory. The spiritual person then seeks the permanent memory of being an expression of supreme consciousness, of being a part of this magical tapestry of life created from one source. And we have ways that we try to do that. We have ways that we try to keep remembering who we truly are, ways of making sure that our, that our identity is built on the foundation of this greater understanding of life. So we use mantras. Many mantras are ways, are used as ways to remember the fact that I am a part of something greater. And the idea here is that we should be repeating the mantra constantly, even when we're going about our day-to-day -day affairs. Now that's challenging, um, but ideally the mantra is like a, a background sound, if you will. It's, you know, like in, 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 on our computers, we have these programs that are running in the background. You don't see them on the main screen. So that's the idea here that the mantra is a background program. It's a, a constant remembrance, a vibrational remembrance that actually I'm connected to the, to the great. And this can help us um, remain, remain free in the constructed reality around us. Um, we can maintain our liberated perspective, our deep insights in this constructed world around us. We also have a mantra that's called the second lesson mantra that we use before we do an action. And this is also part of Dhruva Smriti, this permanent memory, where we remember that I am an expression of the infinite consciousness. The one in front of me is an expression of that same consciousness. So we bring a cosmic ideation into that situation. Even um, on our tantric path, we try to bring this permanent memory into the body. So we try to influence the physiology, influence the, the nervous system. And we do that in different ways. We have the practice of um, uh, pranayama, which is one way that when we use a chakra as part of our ideation, we're bringing this cosmic sense into the physical body. Other practices we have where we sort of touch the chakra with a mantra in order to infuse cosmic ideation into the body. Even when we practice our, our asanas, um, our yoga, we're also trying to make the body more subtle by making sure that the practice of the yoga is done with a mind that's very pure. So not only are we trying to keep remembering who we truly are, to have this constant remembrance of being an expression of something cosmic, but we're trying to instill in the body this type of memory so that we can slowly deconstruct the influence, uh, the limiting influence of the constructed reality around us. We liberate ourselves. A final aspect of this um, constant remembering, Dhruva Smriti, is trying to reverse this subject-object paradigm. And we've looked at this in previous sessions. What happens, sadly, with us human beings is we think that we are the center of the universe. Everything revolves around us. And when we look at society, 
we see the results of that. We see the disrespect we have towards the planet. We see the disrespect that one group has towards another group. Because we think arrogantly that we have so much self-importance, so much power over others. The spiritual person, one who is seeking um, this constant memory of being a cosmic expression, is changing this relationship. So I am not the subject and everything else is my object, but rather I'm the object of a greater subject, that there is a greater intelligence that's working through me. There's a greater wisdom working through me. There's a subtlety within the universe that's working through me. So in that sense, I'm an agent of the universe. I exist in order for the universe to express itself in a constructive way through me to build better paths of evolution for the planet, for everybody around me, for all of the flora and fauna of the planet. So this is a very different perspective where I'm an expression of something infinitely beautiful. And when we have that understanding, when we are connected in that way to that which is infinitely beautiful, then it's much easier to remember the deeper identity of being. So that's, that's the introduction. Now, we'll get to putting all of that into a meditation. I think what I'll do, I'll explain the meditation now, uh, then we'll chant, and then we'll go straight into the meditation. So in this meditation, we will try to go to the the space between incarnations. We're going to time travel back to the womb and then we'll go to conception and then we'll go to the space before conception. We'll anchor ourselves in the heart chakra so we don't, I mean, I'm part, partly joking here, but we, we don't get lost in that ethereal space between incarnations. So the idea then is that we will um, go beyond the body, beyond this life, if you will, in order to free ourselves of the limitations of this life, the conditioning of this life, in order to be able to commune with that infinite presence. So once we've left the body, still anchored to the heart center, there'll be a, um, a, a quiet space to just feel the relationship with the, with the infinite. And try to, in that space, try to, if you do get thoughts coming in the mind related to your day-to-day -day life, just, just let them go. Try to hold this awareness of being in relationship with everything. So I hope you uh, enjoyed that spiritual journey. This has practical implications in life, uh, obviously, when we can keep our minds connected to this cosmic consciousness, we can overcome the limitations of this small ego, the narrated, the limited perspective uh, on life. And so when we make actions, those actions will be guided by this greater understanding of the nature of the universe and our place within it. So if we are looking at building positive memories, then this practice of Dhruva Smriti, of always remembering the divine, always remembering the cosmic reality, always remembering that one is an, ex an expression of something greater, one will be able to build 
beautiful memories through beautiful actions to construct a very noble life. So there we are. Um, if you have any comments or questions, feel free. We've got a little bit of time today. So share your thoughts if you wish. When we normally practice this meditation, we this type of meditation, we do it in a slightly different way. But um, I, I think it's interesting to do it the way we did, whereby we actually try to um, simulate, if you will, reverse reincarnation. <laughs> so we go back to the space we were in before we came into this particular body. And then we commune with the infinite that way. Hi, Sylvia. Namaskar. The other day, as I do every Monday, I was hugging a tree. I've hugged this tree so many times now. It's always the same tree. And this time, something remarkable happened. I, I forgot myself. I forgot the tree. Somehow I was transported <clears throat> into this very pure feeling of being beyond time, beyond place, beyond body. It was absolutely incredible. And I guess in a way, looking at today's conversation, I was transported, you know, to that place um, of just pure essence that we try to tap into when we meditate. And I just was sent there suddenly um, with this, in this embrace with the tree. So it's nice when we have these moments in life um, where there's a crack that opens up and we reconnect with that which is so sweet. Anything anybody wants to express? In that case, we will we will close for the day. So nice to be with you, nice to share with you and uh, best wishes for your life in general and your spiritual life in particular. And for this understanding that we're all expressions of something much greater than ourselves. All right, best wishes, namaskar.